We're back. We're live. This is Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Jay Fidel, and more specifically, it's Global Connections. And do we have a show for you? <laughs> We're going to talk today um, to Jin Dan. That's uh, Nina Mann. She's in California, and uh, she's a special consultant for Project Expedited Justice. Expedite Justice. And um, she works on war crimes and uh, crimes against humanity and uh, the like. And we want to know why she got into that and what she is doing and what effect it's having. Huh? Okay, so let's, let's go, Nina. How did you get involved in this and why are you taking a PhD in it in the University of Amsterdam? Not everybody I know does that. Sure. Well, first, thanks for having me on the show. And for me, I always knew that I wanted to do something in human rights. Uh, when I was in high school, I learned about the Darfur genocide that was going on at the time. I also started reading about uh, water policy in Latin America and the move to privatize water and how normal people weren't able to afford what I considered a basic good because it was considered a, a, a good to be traded on the market. And so I knew I wanted to work in this area, but I didn't really know how at the time. And I, I got my bachelor's degree in development studies, so that development economics, particularly studying uh, natural resources and access by marginalized communities to natural resources. And then I took a break and said, well, well how, do I, how do I do what, what I want to do? And I lived in, in Latin America in Santiago in Chile for three years. And while I was there, I, I worked for a big law firm that represented big multinational corporations, mining companies, and saw how powerful the law is and how powerful I could be as a lawyer in working on these issues. Maybe from the other side than what the corporation, I mean, the, the law firm that I was working on um, <laughs> does. And that's what inspired me to go back to law school and pursue particularly a career in human rights law. Wow, fabulous. Okay, and now you're consulting with uh, Project Expedite Justin. Talk about that and Cynthia Tai. Sure. So in law school, I also discovered an area of law called international criminal law. And so international criminal law is specifically an international body of law that tries the most egregious crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, and war crimes. And I interned at a few different international criminal tribunals, uh, one in Arusha in Tanzania and another one in Phnom Penh in Cambodia. And through my boss in Cambodia, who also works for Project Expedite Justice, I made contact with Cynthia Tai, who, who's the director of that organization. Um, and then I went back to do a master's because I'm, I'm always in school. <laughs> and so I, I did a master's. It was at, at University of Amsterdam as well, international criminal, just, uh, criminal justice. And during that time, also freelanced for Project Expedite Justice. And I've been working with Cynthia since then. We've been um, especially working on projects in the Sudan, including a, a complaint we filed on behalf of children in Southern Sudan. Um, who have been the victims of bombing campaigns. So, uh, Okay, well, you know, it, it goes far and wide. It goes around the world. It goes through many kinds of crimes against humanity, many, many kinds of deprivation of human rights in so many ways. Uh, but today we're going to focus in on multinationals. And it goes yeah. back to your experience with multinationals. Um, so I want to talk about some of the things that you have had contact with and that you are concerned about and that you are either working on or you might work on in the future. And one of them is, is garments, garments in Southeast Asia. Can you talk about that? Sure. So this is, I think the garment industry is a really good example of the way that multinational corporations contribute in a way to serious human rights abuses abroad. So often, um, you know, the clothes that we wear, they're produced in countries like Bangladesh or Cambodia, Vietnam. Um, and the garment factories, they are very much influenced by what the fashion brands need from them. So we have the big, powerful European and North American fashion brands that want to produce high amounts of clothing, often new styles very quickly at a low cost as well. And so they exert a lot of pressure on their business partners in the global south. And, you know, as, as consumers here in the global north, we say, well, that's very convenient for us. We get cheap clothes, new clothes at a, at a 
constant rate. But the reality is, is that on the production side, it often that practice leads to some pretty serious human rights abuses. So I think um, many people heard about the Rana Plaza collapse in 2013 in Bangladesh that killed over a thousand people and injured over 2,500 more. And one of the reasons why that factory collapsed is because um, the safety standards weren't upheld. And one can argue that it, it was in part because of the pressures exerted on these factories to continue to produce and to produce and to produce without um, you know, taking the time to stop and fix the buildings or um, ensure that um, there's sufficient exits for when, when there's emergencies. Um, similar things happen with labor issues in these That factories. certainly reminds me of the, the uh, Triangle uh, Shirtwaist uh, fire in New York. Mm -hmm. In yeah. the, 19, the 19 teens, um, which um, where where women who were working in that uh, in that factory uh, had no way out, and when the when the salvage burned, um, they had to jump out the windows, and they jumped out the windows by the hundreds and died on the street, and mm -hmm. it, it would not have been recognized except for the press, yeah. um, and uh, as a result, uh, it became a turning point in labor in mm -hmm. in the country and probably the world. But let me go back to what you were saying about the collapse of the, uh, the, you know, the factory in Bangladesh. And you mentioned that the factory was not up to standards, safety standards. Were those Bangladeshi safety standards or safety standards from another jurisdiction that should have been applied? They were Bangladeshi safety standards. But another aspect is oftentimes in the, in the contracts, in the supply contracts, there may be a sort of explicit agreement. So there is some effort on the part of the fashion brands or other um, companies to exert some pressure, but there's not a lot of enforcement or follow-up. You know, the other thing, and I know we're early in the conversation, but another thing that strikes me from, from that is that the whole fashion industry requires this uh, fast and cheap and, and um, cheap labor production facility it could not exist in the way it does right now in the world uh, without that. So mm -hmm. it, the economic pressure is a is a is a is an industrial economic pressure. I mean the the fashion industry. Um, and so if you wanted to fix this, what would you do? Well, I think that what's lacking is the incentive to fix it. And on the one hand, I do think consumers play somewhat of a role, but not enough. And what really is the missing link is the fact that because these, for example, the fashion brands are so remotely connected to the actual harm on the ground in Bangladesh, that it's really hard to hold what we see as sort of the very influencing powerful actor in that equation accountable. Um, and of course, if we did have mechanisms to hold them accountable, I think that they would be a little bit more incentivized to exert more pressure on their business partners to ensure that human rights are respected and protected in a different way. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, the, the, there is not a sufficient legal structure to really address these very remote connections, especially when they cross borders. The law that applies often, it's tort law, domestic um, you know, personal injury law, essentially, it's not designed for these transnational contexts. Yeah, so the, the corporate structures and, you know, the, the um, global arrangements uh, have developed, but the law has not developed to, to catch up. And by the way, those two words, um, incentivization and uh, accountability, um, they're going to be on the final exam. Everybody who watches this has to take a final exam. But good news is that it's a, it's a short answer. And it's, it's, a, it's multiple choice, and it's only 10 questions. Those two words are going to be on there. <laughs> <laughs> Two words. Yeah. Okay. Well, you had another example you wanted to give me. Can you can you continue? Sure. So another, um, I think, example that we, touches our daily lives is the example of conflict metals. So especially with the explosion of technological devices, we all have an iPhone in our pocket. Um, those cannot be produced without certain metals, and some of these metals are mined in countries that have very dangerous mines that use child labor, slave labor in order to extract the resources. And, you know, um, but at the same time, you know, you have these big companies like Apple and Tesla and Samsung who express a commitment to not using conflict metals, 
but also exert the excuse that it's almost impossible for them to actually trace the source of the metals that they're putting into their products. And so on the ground, especially the Democratic Republic of Congo is one of the uh, major countries where these kinds of abuses occur. Um, these abuses continue, but once again, that connection between the powerful, usually global Northern uh, corporation and the harms far away in the global South is very remote. And there's, and it, and it creates uh, challenges yeah. to once again- It doesn't have again, to be remote though. It doesn't have to be remote. I think they want, it, they want deniability, right? Oh, in order, absolutely. In order to get it done and they're gonna turn away and look away from what is really happening or not make an effort to find out what is really happening. Um, mm -hmm. And again, we, we have incentivization for accountability um, to make them look and make them take steps because it's hard for you and people who are concerned about this to actually achieve a better condition in the mines. But for Apple and other manufacturers who use these metals, it's not as hard and it's, we have to make yeah. them do it. Mm -hmm. It's not, but I think the excuse is also that the infrastructure and the places where the mining occurs is, is very minimal and a lot of the mining is done in an artisanal way. So it's sort of freelance miners who are entering these mines. Um, and then, yes, absolutely, there's a complex supply chain. So the metals are not sold directly from the artisanal freelance miner to Apple. They go through several, you, you know, partners, subsidiaries of subsidiaries um, before being sold to a supplier. And so these complex supply chains make it easy for the tech co companies to exert, to, you know, to give the excuse, well, we don't actually know where these came from. But I do think that if they had an interest and if they had an incentive, as we talked about, then they could ensure that the mining practices are safer and are not using child labor and slave labor. Slave labor, this is the year, unless I miss my guess, we're in 2020 already, mm -hmm. 20 and 21 is coming soon. How can we have slave, slave labor existing on this planet? Well, unfortunately, you know, at this point in history, there's more slaves in the world than there ever have been in the past. And that includes, you know, people who are trafficked um, and also includes a lot of labor uh, such as bonded labor. So they are given the opportunity to have a job but are indebted to their employer um, because they you know, provided them with housing or moving costs or those kinds of things. And for many people, it takes them years if not a lifetime or even their children's lifetime in order to escape from that bondage. Oh, that's, that's horrible. There's got to be a way to stop that. Now, the way to stop that, you would think, is by governmental action. So slave labor, to me, represents a governmental failure. Uh, shouldn't this be handled at a governmental foreign policy level? Well, in a lot of places where these events occur, the governments are struggling with so many issues that this is not really on their agenda right now. There's other, you know, more pressing political instability sometimes or conflicts. And so it, this isn't really their priority. And, and also for them, you know, this is a source of revenue to, you know, to sell these resources. And so to meddle with that system is, it's tricky for them. Yeah. Well, it's tricky for Apple too, because Apple can say to us, okay, we, 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 we didn't really, we turned away before, but now we're really, really, really committed. On the other hand, these metals are commodities. They're commodity markets. They could go around the world. They could be fungible. They are fungible. Mm -hmm. um, they could be sold and resold and marketed and auctioned and what have you. Um, very, very hard to trace them. And, and Apple would be, you know, legitimate if it said, yeah, we, we just can't do it because we don't know what's happening there under the surface. So my question to you is, let's assume that Apple really wants to, you know, solve this problem. What could it do? What could it do to trace this in the commodity market and make sure there's no slave labor mining it? It's, it's not an easy task and it requires a sufficient amount of resources, absolutely. But I do think that some of these big tech companies have the resources, but it's a matter of striking that balance between 
impacting their profit margin and affecting the shareholders, you know, level of satisfaction and doing the right thing. And if they're not, you know, there's recently in the DC um, circuit court in the federal district, there was, I think, as far as I know, one of the first cases filed against Apple, Google, Dell, I think Microsoft and Tesla um, it, on behalf of children in the DRC for the mining of conflict metals. So we'll see how this case goes. These kinds of incentives may drive them to actually pay more attention to their supply chains and pay more attention to where the metals come from rather than just paying lip service and not actually walking the walk. <laughs> now that, that, that's interesting because you know they'll defend it, it's big money for them. Mm -hmm. And the cost of correction is big money. And between those companies you named, they have the big money. And I wonder where the, where the media fits, you know, as in the Triangle Shirtwaist Fire uh, back in the early, early 20th century, New York, um, the press made the difference. The press revealed things that people didn't know about and they were horrified. Uh, has the press been doing a job on this now? I think not enough. I remember when I was a kid, there was a lot of scandal about slave labor and Nike shoe factories. Um, mm -hmm. and, and there was a lot of people who said, okay, this is going to make the difference. This is going to be the push. But this was when I was a child. And, <laughs> and I think not very much has changed in that industry. Um, Nike definitely got bad, bad press, a bad rap for a few years. But I, I think the media picks up on stories sometimes like this, but then we move on, especially in, in today's world where there's always new stories, always new um, things to worry about. <laughs> yeah, well, the stakes are really high. Mm -hmm. The stakes are high for the amount of money to pay to, to the people who work on the, on the medals, for example. Um, and for that matter, whatever compensation goes away, to, goes, away to the, goes to the uh, slaves. Mm -hmm. um, the stakes are high for, for Apple. I mean, Apple and all the other you mentioned, uh, they have huge reserves of cash. Part of that cash comes from this exact process. Yeah. And we have stockholders who, you know, who are making a lot of money. Those stocks have done very well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not just the design we see in uh, Silicon Valley. It's, it's the manufacturers where they actually you know, make the money. Right. Um, so, you know, it strikes me that they have every reason to defend these cases and they're going to defend these cases vigorously. And they're going to talk about, hmm, they're going to talk about those defenses of, we don't know where it is. And they're going to be talking about, uh, they're going to preserve the, uh, or try really hard to preserve limitation of liability for corporations. And in my mind, that all raises the question of whether the corporate model, the capital model the multinational corporate capital model that we have working in the world today is adequate to deal with the human rights violations that are taking place. Um, don't you think we need to change that model? I think so. And there's a different ways to go about changing it. But I think you're, you're really right to say that, you know, they'll defend themselves. And I think at the way that the law is designed now, they have a pretty adequate defense. Because if I was Apple, I would point out that that Apple company, they didn't cause the child or slave labor. And so there's no causal connection. However, there is arguably a lot of contribution because if they, and many times they're the primary purchaser, the primary buyer, if they didn't buy these metals, you know, unless different standards were kept, um, then it, it, these harms wouldn't happen. But you know, they can always just say, well, we didn't, we didn't cause it. The connection is too remote. Um, I don't think that we can change the current corporate model, especially the transnational corporate model with the complex business structures of subsidiaries and parent companies where they limit liability among each other or, you know, very extended supply chains. Um, and they do have their benefits as well. I think we can all agree that the reason that we've experienced so much economic growth in the last hundred years really is because of the way that we have creatively structured our business organizations. But if we are going to do that, then we also need a legal system that matches it. In a domestic context, we have it. You know, if, if, if you encounter problems in the domestic context where a business is responsible for causing harm, you can sue them. 
Now, why can't we have that at an international level, especially in light of the fact that the kinds of harms we see internationally are much more grave. We're seeing, you know, crimes against humanity, slavery, genocide. Um, and so we should have the laws to match what the, the economic reality is. Yeah, just let's take a moment and, and, uh, and, and, and parse that out. A crimes against humanity, uh, genocide, uh, human rights, I guess, and, and, and um, there, there must be the, more of those kinds of crimes. Uh, can, you, can, you, can you say they're all the same? Are they all connected? War crimes is another example. Are they all connected? Do we have to unpack that into different procedures, proceedings, different statutes, different international agreements? Um, or, or are they all merged somehow um, you know, in, in the international, what do you want to call it, human rights enforcement? Mm -hmm. So a lot of my research is um, I'm trying to figure out a way where we can take these international human rights standards and um, and adapt them in a way where we can use domestic law um, so that they are a little bit more, you, you can use the same domestic law. So for example, argue negligence of Apple, um, you know, whether that is because they are a, supplying from a supplier who uses slave labor or whether the factory um, where the supplies are getting from are, is, is protected by a paramilitary organization that is committing violent crimes against the local community or even um, in the context of environmental crimes sometimes. So that, you know, that's an idea that I have in terms of being able to use domestic law existing structures to go after these crimes because international human rights law is fantastic, but it, its challenge is it has a hard time with private actors and binding private actors. States are obligated to uphold certain rights. They're also obligated to you know, investigate and punish violations that occur in their territories, but they don't sign, they don't sign the human yeah, rights. So it's very hard to enforce international mm -hmm. law. I mean, look at look at the uh, South China Sea's decision by by the court in The Hague. The Chinese, who are a, a member of that um, organization, law that I, I'm not sure what organization it is, but the organization that that gives right to the rise to that court, um, they blew it off. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's very hard to enforce international law of any kind, including law of the sea. So I want to talk about the U.S. Alien Tort Statute. Let's refer to it as AIS. Because that's a, that's a domestic, what is it not? ATS. A, ATS, I'm sorry. A federal law be used by human rights advocates. And so, um, you know, it, it seems to me that if, if I'm a multinational doing, you know, American multinational or a, a multinational with its roots, its headquarters, its, its, you know, place of origin, what have you, in the U.S., that should, that should pre prevent me from doing human rights violations overseas. Uh, does it? Is it working? Does it need to be amended in order to achieve what you're talking about, a sort of transnational approach? Yeah. So the ATS is a very interesting law. It was enacted in 1789, and nobody's quite sure what the idea behind it was. It's a law that allows aliens, so non-U.S. persons, to bring a claim in federal court for and this is an old fashioned term, the violation of the laws of nations, which basically just means violations of international law. And it lay very dormant for many years. And in 1980, uh, a human rights lawyer realized, wait a minute, this can be used for certain human rights violations. And since then, it's really experienced an explosion in federal courts as a tool to um, particularly go after corporations for their involvement in human rights abuses abroad. However, it, with time, and especially recently, its scope has been narrowed quite a lot. And so in 2018, the Supreme Court heard a case where they decided that foreign corporations cannot be sued under the ATS. And the rationale behind it was that the foreign defendant in this case, Arab Bank, um, worked closely with foreign governments and Therefore, if the courts were, able, were allowed to render decisions on foreign corporate activities, that would implicate foreign policy in a way that would actually impact the separation of powers, because it's up to the executive branch, the president's branch, to engage in our foreign relations. 
So it's a very and interesting way. The president way. at the time was your, your friend Donald Trump, as I, in 2018. In 2018, yes. But even before that, there was a lot of efforts and there was a lot of sort of, um, there was a case in the Second Circuit to the New York um, court that also said no corporate liability. So there's been a lot of push to limit corporate well, does liability. That, does that work, Nina? I mean, uh, stand aside. Don't don't be a human human rights uh, advocate for a moment. Just mm -hmm. just be a lawyer who knows all the things you know. Does that argument really work to have them hide behind a foreign policy uh, argument and uh, excuse themselves uh, on that basis? I don't think so. Um, and you look at other jurisdictions. Um, so, for example, Canada recently had a really interesting case where they allow foreign law to be used for tort claims. And you look at European jurisdictions that allow both civil and criminal cases to be brought against foreign corporations. And there seems to be a pretty comfortable approach, you know, they're, they're pretty comfortable with allowing that. I, um, the way I see it is, I think this was a, a, a way to limit liability. Um, well, it's troublesome because it's troublesome because it has constitutional overtones to it. Um, and if that if that argument prevails you know, on, a, on a plenary basis, well, wow, it, it, you know we've we've been cut off from enforcing um, that international law against companies that are American or do business in the U.S. It's very troublesome. So let's assume it's right for a moment, mm -hmm. and I would like to think it's not. I agree with you. But <clears throat> what then is the is the uh, is the mo? How do you proceed against this kind of violation um, in the absence of a statute like the ATS Alien Tort Statute? Well, there, there's at least one other statute I can think of off the top of my head, which is the Anti-Terrorism Act. So, if there are crimes that are related to terrorist financing, that's an that's a way to. Um, you know, get these into courts. But what I'm really exploring is using more sort of common tort law, so especially negligence, which is the law that's very often used when there's an accident or, um, you know, some sort of personal injury situation. And I'm curious to see whether we can make the argument that this, these companies have a duty of care. So for example, you know, Apple owes the the employees and minors in DRC a duty of care. And when they breach that by exerting pressure and creating this situation in which, um, you know, there's a demand for very cheap metals, you know, maybe there's a way to, to start using the law creatively, but this is an area that's very underexplored and, um, and still needs to, needs a lot of work. Yeah, and there's also the possibility, is there not, of, of using the law of, of other nations uh, in the, the courts of other nations. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's not beyond an American lawyer to go to the courts of France, for example, and enforce uh, international law, or French law against a multinational there, which may give you more leverage. Am I right? In some cases, yes, particularly if it's a, but it, it depends if there's jurisdiction. So often, you know, multinational corporations, they have their domicile in another country and you can definitely go to those countries. However, if you're going to countries where the harm occurred, a lot of times the available defendant is the, for example, subsidiary company. And the problem in, with that is oftentimes the parent company in when it face, when its subsidiary faces a lawsuit will just dissolve it, dissolve the, the subsidiary or empty its coffers. So it has nothing to give. Um, and so that's why it is desirable to go after the, you know, the, the top level actor that cannot run away, cannot just dissolve and, and disappear. Um, but definitely if there is jurisdiction, so if a company is based in another country, for example, there's a big case in the Netherlands against Shell um, for harms in Nigeria, or also a case in France against uh, BNP Paribas for harms in um, allegedly that occurred in the Sudan. Well, you know, it's really all about um, holding their feet to the fire. Feet to the fire is also going to be in the final exam. Uh, and I, and I just uh, wonder, I mean, at the end of the day, the way people in general, maybe not you and me, but, uh, or Project Expedite Justice sees it, um, the way people see it is um, 
um, there's a, at least a balance here because we have to keep on doing business. These multinationals are not only making a profit, they're providing goods and services, uh, they're filling um, needs of the people on the planet. Um, and so we, we can't be um, too heavy handed about uh, throwing them out of school. We have to find a way to do this in kind of in a nuanced fashion. Do you agree with that? And what is the nuanced fashion if you do? I do agree with that. I think that that is a, it's a really important balance. The world looks the way it does because we have allowed international trade to flourish and we are in a lot of ways better off. But at the same time, I think we can all agree that when we hear about these cases, about these situations in which harms are occurring just because we want cheaper clothes or a new iPhone, our gut is to say, well, I think these powerful actors should be responsible in some way. And, you know, if there is a mechanism to hold them responsible, maybe they will change their behavior. Yeah, you know, for years, uh, years back, I, I'm, I'm not talking about more than, say, 10 or 15, there, there's been a move to, um, to encourage investors to invest in impact investing. In other words, you don't invest your money in companies that do violations of, of fairness and equity and, um, you know, and human rights. Um, and I don't know the status of that now. I don't know how much leverage they have or they can get with the investing public because the investing public in large part wants to make a return on its investment. They're not too concerned about the impact aspect, but what about that? Is that a viable way to you know, weigh in on this? You know, I, I think you would need a critical mass in order to have that actually change the tides. And I think unfortunately that the majority of investors it's either just not on their radar, or like you said, they prefer to have high returns rather than make socially responsible investments. So even though there are investors who do take the time and do you know, um, care about where their money goes, there's enough that don't. And as long as there's enough that don't, um, I don't think behavior is gonna change. There are sort of, there's some legal things that can happen. So in Europe, there's a, a new push for what they're calling human rights due diligence laws. I believe um, if Switzerland or France was the first to pass it. And um, since then, there's been quite a few other European countries that have laws that require big companies to do human rights due diligence. So they have to check to make sure that their business partners and their subsidiaries are not abusing human rights. Um, and they have to, and just in the practice of doing the due diligence of checking to make sure and um, monitoring it constantly, um, that's already a big difference. And so with these laws, you know, perhaps investors have a little bit more of a, a system in which to check whether their companies are being responsible or not based on mm -hmm. their reporting under the due diligence laws. Yeah, and derivative um, suits, I guess. Uh, and so, you know, you need to hold the, the directors and the, and the management responsible. Otherwise, the thing disappears behind the corporate veil. Mm -hmm. And that's a whole new discussion we could have. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, one thing is um, um, that, that people who are interested in uh, human rights in this planet, uh, they need to get on shows like this one and talk about it. That's what I think. And therefore, I think we'd like to do some more shows with you and, and follow uh, your adventures in, in, uh, in so many places around the world. Thank you very much, Nina Mann. We really appreciate you coming on. Well, thank you so much. I've really enjoyed chatting. Aloha.